Okay, let's get started. Got the risk warning, risk warning on the screen in front of us. And we're all done with that. So it was an interesting week last week. Got a good good finish to the week in terms of uh, in terms of stock markets. Obviously in the UK, pretty obvious reason. We had the uh, the general election result, which was a bit of a shock to markets, and a number of shares, even in the benchmark, up close to 10%. And obviously the FTSE pushing back into uh, its all-time highs, and you can see that reflected in our UK 100 chart. So this is the uh, the rising wedge pattern that we've uh, we've had going for a while. Now there's been a few variations on it depending on which lows you connect. But you know, using uh, just the connection of these two lows, you can see we've pushed through it, but spiked way way back above it again on Thursday, so created quite a large hammer pattern, and then that got a follow through on Friday when we got the election result. So we're just shy of this uh, 7120 type uh, all-time highs that we we saw earlier in, uh, sorry, later in April. And so that's, you know, that's the major barrier in front of us, but looking at the strength of the action over the prior two days, You'd imagine in the course of this week, I, uh, you know, I would posit we could see at least a challenge of that that high again because we have this as a um, a kind of steady uptrend. You can see here we're making steadily higher highs and higher lows. So I can think you can confidently call this an uptrend on the weekly chart, and so that's generally a cause for for bias to the upside and. You know, just um, you know, talking about a hammer on a daily chart. I mean, look at the the tails on these candlesticks here from last week. That is a that's a huge reversal. So one one thing to talk about here is actually uh, why was there such a uh, bit of a shock going into Friday? Well, obviously to, in, on the UK front, um, an element of concern about the election. It's not really been that evident this year. I think one thing you can talk about perhaps is that um, the FTSE has made new records this year, so hardly indicative of major fear in the market about the election, but you could maybe argue that the, the progress has not been as much as it could have been uh, when you look at, for example, the, uh, the German DAX or the Germany 30 as we trade it. That's in massive gains this year. The FTSE has been a bit more stumbly. So maybe now the election's out of the way, um, even though we're not direct beneficiaries of U, uh, ECB QE, FTSE could still, tend to, could still tend to do a bit of a catch-up here, especially given that the Germany 30 has come off a bit. Okay. So that's consideration, but uh, so that's the that's the sort of the election. You know, generally positive for markets. We've got a bit of a question coming up as to whether that positivity can follow through in the longer term. That's a UK specific thing, but you'll see um, that there were some some more global issues. Uh, this is a daily candlestick chart for the uh, German Bund, and you can see that uh, not just last week, but really the sort of beginnings of the week before. You know, we've got a, a massive uptrend in bond markets, um, basically preempting and following the announcement of ECB QE, in which the ECB obviously buy bonds, and everybody's front-running that in the market. Um, and we've reached very close. So this is the bond price. We reached very close to zero percent uh, bond yield on the German bond. Almost went negative on the 10-year German Bund, uh, but it didn't quite get there, and we've seen a massive reversal since. And basically, bond markets, bond markets were collapsing last week. And uh, that doesn't mean that equity markets have to collapse, but really, like we saw with oil prices, any time a market, which is a big, major market, is collapsing, you know, that affects sentiment in equities, even if there's not a direct uh, implication. Um, and in this case, there is. I mean, bond prices are going up because of QE. Stocks are going up because of QE, very simply put. And uh, so the fact that uh, bonds dived like this wasn't just in bonds. I can maybe come back to this chart in a second, but you know, we can also see that it was in gilt. Um, 
less uh, less heavily so this has maybe been a bit of a longer term process happening but you know we did break through that low and you know this is something of a kind of failed higher high and then a um so basically a lower high and then a lower low so below the moving averages below this rising trend line in gilts um suggest that we could have um higher interest rates to look forward to in the UK and um similar thing in US treasuries um and uh, trading through the the T bond and the T note ten year. <clears throat> now, this is a um, you know again a huge huge hammer on this daily daily candlestick here. But if we look at the weekly chart, it's uh, you know it's closed well back into the middle of the range, but still a, a few really bearish looking candlesticks. There's obvious support here where, you know, I had these lines drawn in, this 38% uh, FIBO, these lines down here, this uh, this peak from the uh, the week of the 12th of October. Um, it's a very support in this area, so not surprising to see a bounce, but how long it can hold is is open to a question because this has been quite a long-running uptrend and we've seen a major correction there. Maybe that's the end of it. Maybe we've just flushed out a few weak holders and we can travel up to the, the highs again. That's possible. But I think people are going to be pretty hesitant, and uh, the risk is that we fail to push below, you know, uh, sorry, above this previous support turned potential resistance here, and we maybe could track back down again towards sort of 153, uh, 153 area, as I sort of alluded to in the older chart forum here. Typically, you you know, when you see a sharp tail like that, oftentimes the, the next candle will come and test the body of the uh, the the candle but not dip into the tail but I think because this tail is so long and because of the sort of speed of the move decline and decline before possible that we could jump back again uh, go back lower before perhaps moving higher in some sort of bottoming pattern obviously below below this low and all bets are off and we're you know that could be serious again So a slight deviation into the bonds, which is not something I typically cover a lot in these um, in these in these webinars, but um, definitely been a, a big factor in what's moving markets, and I think it will be again this week. We're seeing that the price is drifting lower a bit here, and um, you know could be setting up for another spike in, in yields, and, and that could worry equities. And I think it is part of the reason that we're seeing um, lower levels thereabouts in Europe and sort of a a fuzzy looking open for, for US markets. Um, looking ahead, um, data wise, we had a, quite a big one over the weekend. Obviously, China cut interest rates, and that's why we can see the, um, the China A50 is one of the sort of few uh, few risers. Obviously, the, uh, the UK 100 is to some extent tracking alongside that just because the um, the uh, the mining companies in the UK tend to follow the activity in China, and that's helping the FTSE outperform. But otherwise, other global markets not reacting too strongly to the um, the rate cut. Um, and I think again, it's because of some of this softness in um, uh, first, well, firstly in uh, in bond markets, and then all prices perhaps have uh, put in a little intermediate term top. We could maybe jump into that. Let's. Um, well, since I've covered the UK, let's just have a look at Germany since um, we did mention that before. So, um, trend line's proving, you know, quite instrumental at the moment across a few different markets. This is a trend line connecting four different lows in the Germany 30, so definitely something that's widely watched. And uh, that, just in combination with uh, the uh, the lows here in the, the early part of March, good sort of um, combination of support, and it's, it's worked quite well. And we've worked, we basically bounced back into this cluster of moving averages and this broken rising trend line here. So a cluster, a bit of resistance in this area could mean another test of the lows in the Germany 30. Basically, the, the trend is just not as, as strong as it was. And so we've had a decent correction. Is that, you know, is that an opportunity or is it a sign that this um, really strong trend needs a really strong correction? 38.2%. It's not necessarily a massive correction. You know, it could dip to 50 or even 61.8, which brings us closer to this longer-term 55-week moving average. You know, that would be surprising, given that the um, the ECB is still f fully engaged in quantitative easing. So that does still provide a bit of a general bias to the upside in, in equities. But you've got to be aware that this correction is looking a bit dicey at the moment. 
I moved back through that declining trend line, I think, and, and, and through this resistance, you know, would obviously show some strength in the market. And I think that would be what's needed to get back up to the to the highs and then possibly new records again. But, you know, while we're while we're below this area, I still think there's a bit of a bias to the downside. We look at uh, U.S. markets. Been very sideways, but um, it was a bit of a turnaround late last week, and that's um, you know we mentioned the, um, the kind of UK um, UK aspect of it with the uh, the elections last week. We had the non-farm payrolls, and the number was largely a non-event. It basically was almost exactly in line with expectations, just one um, one thousand below expectations, uh, which is the closest I've seen to consensus for a while. So not a particularly interesting result, but there was a drop in um, average earnings growth. Uh, some of the fundamentals are a bit weak within the report, but still the headline growth was over 200,000 jobs created. So it was quite a good Goldilocks report that um, still showing some the the U.S. economy is improving, um, growing, it's um, producing jobs at a pace that the market's comfortable with, but not such a strong pace that it means an imminent hike in interest rates. I think it probably all but ruled out June as a possibility for, for hiking interest rates. September possibly still on the cars, but I would suggest it's probably going to be later. Markets, um, if you look at um, uh, Fed funds futures, are basically pricing in a, uh, a rate hike in December. So that probably seems like the most, more likely scenario at this point. Um, technically, though, we're at the top of this range. You know, if we, uh, you know, tempting looking at this price action to believe that we're about to see a breakout, and we have seen a breakout of this cluster of highs, which to me is a, is a positive sign, but still uh, we have not quite seen that breakout yet. And so, if you are long the market here, you know, you're going in before the market, uh, before the breakout, really, and so you're getting a better price if prices do eventually break up to the top side, but you're risking the fact that the market just rolls around um, back into this range trading that we've seen. So it's found a minor bit of resistance up at this uh, March 24 peak. My feeling is that perhaps we could get back up to the, um, the all-time record, perhaps push a little new record, and then reverse back into the range again, kind of the way it, lo it looks like it could happen. And then maybe from there we can push on to, to higher highs and higher lows again. Still a general upward bias in in U.S. stocks, I think, but it's um, it's been pretty choppy during earnings season. But we're getting to the end of the earnings season. You know, this week and next week's a lot of retail stocks. That'll be important for the general, uh, you know, general sense of how the U.S. economy is doing. But I think probably earnings season's not been quite as bad as some had hoped. And uh, my 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 sense. Given the direction of the trend and given some of the key earnings releases, that probably we can move higher past it. But we do need to break these highs first, obviously, to, to confirm that's actually taken place. Um, now, um, let's, go, let's go over to currencies because there is a, there are a few important um, economic events happening this week, which tend to affect currencies a bit more than um, the stock markets that, you know, have uh, have the other kind of effectors, uh, factors that we've been discussing already. Um, it's quite a big week for the, the British pound. We've got industrial production on Tuesday, and we obviously already just had the, the um, Bank of England today um, unsurprisingly kept um, rates at current levels didn't interfere with the, the amount of assets purchased under QE. Um, so no big surprise there. That really hasn't affected the pound too much. But what will is the um, Bank of England inflation report on Wednesday, because then we'll hear a bit more about the thinking of the Bank of England, particularly post the election. Because there was a lot of speculation, particularly at the end of last year, about whether the rate hike would take place maybe a bit before the election, a bit after. Um, you know, there's rumours that there was actually a secret agreement between um, George Osborne and Mark Carney to, to keep rate hikes um, post the election. So, you know, believe it or not, that, that is what's happening at the moment. Um, but we obviously do have the factor of um, oil prices having pushed inflation really low. And uh, 
general consensus at the moment is no rate hikes this year, but we have seen a bit of a bounce in, in oil prices recently. So maybe those two dissenters um, uh, could come back and, and vote for a rate hike again. We, we, don't, we won't know that for uh, a couple of weeks until we get those Bank of England minutes, which will be more important. Uh, but before that, like I said, we've got this um, Bank of England report on Wednesday. Wednesday is quite a big one in general because we have Chinese industrial production and retail sales. You know, they're real two bellwether reports in terms of how well the Chinese economy is performing. We've got that terrible trade data last week, pretty poor inflation data. Uh, that's why they cut interest rates. And so this, this data is generally expected to improve a little bit over the, the previous month. This is April's data, so it's expected to be a bit better than March. But, um, you know, be fully prepared for a downsized shock because that would be more in line with um, what we've been seeing recently out of China. We've got um, uh, GDP release from Germany, as well as, other, uh, as, well as another few um, European nations. Um, and then we have the unemployment rate and the average earnings data for, for the UK. Um, so a few things, a few things happening on uh, Wednesday, and that's followed up in the US session by retail sales. So Wednesday, quite a big one. Otherwise, it's a little bit slower than the rest of the week. Nothing that I would particularly point to on Thursday. Um, a lot of the Europe's on, in holiday for the Ascension Day. And um, uh, producer prices, I mean, it's a, it's a secondary report, really, uh, for the US on Thursday. And then US industrial production on Friday. So given that's the case, given all those discussions, let's have a look at the, um, sterling. And we are at quite a tipping point in sterling in my mind. Um, so this is a one-minute chart, so I was just following after the Bank of England. When it didn't, not too much happened. Um, so this is the daily chart. Well, actually, I think better, actually, more instructive. I think we've already looked at this, but more instructive to look at this weekly chart. This is a huge reversal candlestick at this declining trend line pushed above, reversed back lower. The fact that we've undone that reversal candlestick just the next week is, to me, a pretty strong sign of, of strength in the market, not to mention the fact that we have now closed above that declining trend line, which did pretty much capture three, you know, a couple of minor peaks and a, and a major peak there. We're above this, um, you know, you can see it better on the, uh, the daily chart that um, you know, we pushed through held held these moving averages and um and now we've pushed them broken up to the upside now potential for a double top here but my suspicion is that maybe we get a bit of a dip or not even um because the market's looking pretty the pound's looking quite strong against the dollar right now <clears throat> we could um we could be in for a bit of a sea change but some of this data that we see this week alongside the bank of england is going to determine whether this gets a follow through and um, breaks out to a longer term upside trend or um you know, it's a false breakout and we reverse back lower and with a little double top here. Um, also interesting to watch the, the euro pound because that sort of was in, starting to imply some, uh, some relative strength for the euro, but that all kind of got undone um, on Friday when we had that, um, that huge move higher in the pound after the election. And so, what was starting to look like potentially a reverse or perhaps a little double bottom, it now is starting to look more like just another consolidation before a move lower. But again, we'll have to, um, <clears throat> you know, we'll have to see. You can sort of do a sort of sketchy trend line through the two lows there. That could be a bit of an indication of weakness. Um, but the fact that we just that was basically a false break and a sort of dark cloud cover type pattern here. Um, not quite engulfing that whole week because that was obviously a strong week, but pushing through these lows will probably drop in further in euro pounds. So that 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 big boost to the euro not really taking place against the pound, still potentially will against the euro, uh, against the dollar. Sorry, um, yeah, a bit of a complicated looking chart on first glance, but that, but, but not really. Um, you know, we've broken this declining trend line. We broke above this this high here, which is something of a neckline for a double bottom pattern. So after having closed above it, we ran into this 21-week um, moving average and a very indecisive doji-type candlestick last week. Doesn't really imply the market's about to fly to the upside, and we are just banging into this, you know, this supply zone here where the prices broke down uh, back in February. 
shape. To my mind, we're, we're you know we're most likely moving back down to retest this low again, just beneath um, uh, one oh one oh uh, one ten, sorry one eleven. You know this kind of critical area that we were able to to break through. Um, down to there, we could get a move back higher again, but this um, sort of double top type pattern in the RSI means that we could maybe dip down to this sort of demand area, which is not altogether conclusive, but built off of just where we broke um, through this uh, through this weekly candlestick here. So that that fall was about 106, I believe. 109, sorry, 106. Yeah, that would be a bit more drastic. <coughs> Dollar yen, to, to my mind, is barely worth pull, pulling up the chart at the moment. It's just a total range bound market. Um, similar, you know, on that same theme. Oh, I guess one chart that I'd actually mentioned previously, and you know, this is just not bearing out too well, is uh, there was a potential double bottom here in the New Zealand dollar. That's just had a couple of false breaks, and the the risk of a rate cut in New Zealand is uh, really pushing this lower. If there isn't a rate up, that'd be quite a surprise, and that could be the catalyst for getting us back above the break line, and maybe this pattern eventually working out. But it's uh, it's not looking too good right now. You know, basically a false break of this declining trend line, <clears throat> and uh, you know, maybe some opportunities down here for a triple bottom. But uh, yeah, this double bottom looking pretty pretty poor at the moment. But what I was going to say is that. <clears throat> Before we move into, uh, well, as we move into commodities, gold, it's just total chop zone right now. You know, for those who trade just gold, um, you know, on the shorter term, there's a lot of movement happening. So, you know, there are opportunities. For those who have a slightly longer time frame, typically the sort of four hour top daily time frame that I cover a lot on, this, on these webinars, um, you know, a, a time frame perhaps more suited to someone who's not trading all day. Um, then there's, there's really it's a very difficult market to trade at the moment. Gold. Um, there was potentially a um, a inverse head and shoulders here. You know, it wasn't able to get through the neckline, and then um, this is this trend line here has kind of been acting as a support um, right around that sort of 1180, which is our long term level of support, um, which is basically through these lows back here, and it kind of corresponds with. Um, where we kind of broke from the lows a couple of times through that area. So that's at 1180 to some extent is still containing gold, but it's below these moving averages for the most part. And it's still kind of within this declining trend line, um, within this sort of triangle type pattern. Um, but really until we get out of this, um, conclusively out of this trading zone between 1180 and, and 1220, it's just as, you know, you can, with the benefit of hindsight, if you're selling a 1120, buying a 1180, you know, there's been a few opportunities with a bit of a drawdown here, but uh, not much trending action here. And same with dollar yen. I just, you know, <clears throat> unless you're forced to trade it, what well, you know, why would you trade it? Let's just let's just find some currencies with some distinctive directional movement. Silver, maybe a slightly clearer picture. We have this um, similar sort of triangle type pattern you can see on the weekly chart with a base at these kind of lows. Clear from the fact that it's, it's difficult to trade at the moment, but it's, it's, it's contained within this triangle pattern. So again, the sort of range trading technique of buying oversold, um, selling overbought um, according, according to the pattern is working to some extent. But uh, you know, once we get more of a conclusive breakdown from either this support, which is about 15.50, or this declining trend line, uh, you know, that would be the key trigger to, to some bigger movements in these markets and these metals markets. But at the moment, I think just the uncertainty of the US dollar and um, when exactly the Fed are going to hike, hike rates um, is causing the dollar to correct. But these metal markets, people are still hesitant to really buy into them because they still think a rate hike is coming sometime. Um, it's just causing them to go sideways. Um, a more interesting market than oh, – well, I quickly mentioned copper. It's not the most heavily traded, I know, but it's still one of the most traded um, instruments and um, had quite a major breakthrough 
which I probably mentioned last week, and we're still waiting for some follow-through on that. We basically stalled at this 55-week um, SMA. And so possibility of a correction down to this quite strong former resistance possibly turning future support, and then maybe a move higher. Because again, it's a good example of where there was quite a strong pattern of this, this weekly reversal, which we've now, within the space of a few weeks, with a couple of long tails and holding this rising trend line, have, have closed just about back above. So potential for a, um, a stronger reversal in copper here. Hard to really see why it's happening because of the slowdown in China. You can argue that these rate cuts are going to eventually feed through to a strengthening in the, US, in the um, Chinese economy. Maybe the Chinese government are bending a bit on their determination to um, slow down the, the property market over there. If the property bubble just sort of pick up again, that's where copper gets a lot of its demand. So potentially that. Uh, but crude oil is the, um, you know, is one of the biggest moving inter interesting markets at the moment. And we did get that breakout higher basically in anticipation of the uh, the drawdown in inventories. So we had the first, last week we had the first weekly drawdown in U.S. inventories, uh, U.S. oil stockpiles. And uh, so it means that they actually used more than they um, uh, more than they produced for the first time in four months last week. Um, but uh, the market had been pricing in in advance, and basically on the day we got a reversal, and uh, we've been sort of following through to the downside since, and, and produced on a daily chart this um, this evening star, um, evening doji star potentially pattern um, at the top of the trend, and we had a break on this, uh, this RSI trend line. So trend is still just about up. I, I would call this a quite a significant low for determining where the, the highs and lows are. Through there, I think, which is we're only just above at the moment, which, um, which comes in about uh, 63.30. Um, that, I think, could be the trigger for a slight change in trend and all, perhaps down to the downside. Um, and if we do get down to the test, the bottom of the trend, uh, the, this uh, channel, it's not the strongest channel ever, but the, the bottom trend line is strong. There's no real confirmation at the top, but the fact that we haven't been able to get up there um, and stall down to the beginning of this, this supply zone created by this low over here, to me, is a, is a bit of a sign of weakness. And um, people could start be looking at oil again in terms of just the general oversupply and, uh, and lower demand from the likes of China. Um, so, so that's it. I think I've covered most of the major bases here. Um, haven't seen any um, any questions coming through, so I think we'll call it a day at that. Thank you very much for attending. Good luck trading this week. It's Jasper Royal signing out. Cheers.